welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the NARM Training Institute. I'm your host, Emily Ruth, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. Hi, Transforming Trauma listeners. We're so excited to share the power of healing from complex trauma with all of you. It's inspiring to know that so many of you tune in to learn about how healing from complex trauma is possible. Are you interested in deepening your understanding of NARM? We're excited to present The Inner Circle, NARM's online learning community. Each month, members receive direct mentorship from NARM creator, Dr. Lawrence Heller, NARM training director, Brad Kammer, and other NARM faculty as they present NARM demonstration sessions and provide extensive debriefs on applying NARM with real clients. They also present live topic webinars that deconstruct the various elements of complex trauma. Members also get access to archived material and other learning resources, as well as access to a private Facebook group with other professionals learning NARM around the world. The Inner Circle is a hub for the international NARM community where people working with complex trauma come together to connect, network, and develop trauma-informed projects to help our world. You, our Transforming Trauma listeners, can receive a free 14-day trial with access to the three-month archive by visiting www.narmtraining.com forward slash free trial. And now for our interview. Susan Raffo is a body worker and cultural worker with training and practice in multiple forms of craniosacral therapy, global somatics, and a wide range of modalities, including NARM, somatic practice, and many other learnings from teachers who have touched her deeply. Susan's book, Liberated to the Bone, addresses the intersections between healing our physical bodies and healing our social relations, which are shaped by violence. In the book, Raffo addresses intergenerational trauma, social justice, organizing, and how all of these things are relevant to our bodies. The book illuminates three different approaches to healing, ending violence, the significance of being rooted in the present, and creating the conditions to address unfinished histories and generational trauma. Please enjoy this conversation with Susan Raffo and Brad Kammer. Welcome, Susan, to Transforming Trauma. It is very good to be here, Brad. Thank you for the welcome. Yeah. So listeners don't know this yet, but we this is a long time in the making because we met some years ago and we've been wanting to have these conversations. I think we might have had one or two conversations, but we thought our conversations are so rich and we thought, let's do this for the podcast and share some of your wisdom and your heart with our community. And I'm just so happy to have you on here. I'm grateful to be here. Uh, it's been a long time coming. I think it's, it has been two conversations you and I had one-on-one. But I also talk to you when you're not around because because of your work. And so sometimes I'm listening to you on the screen and I'm having a conversation with you, but you're not actually there. Well, reading your book, I've been feeling the same way, having this conversation with you. And it's just been so touching. And I can't wait to dive in a little bit more to your book as we go. But let, let's just start from the beginning, how we like to start in uh, these Transforming Trauma episodes, which is what would you hope for listeners to take away from our time here? My guess is what you and I are going to talk a lot about is the relationship between the individual and the collective, and in particular, the way that trauma sort of weaves back and forth between the two and across time. Because as you know, a lot of my work is as an organizer within systems change, as well as within our internal systems. I think if there's anything, it is to link arms more thoroughly as together we look and try to figure out what gets in the way of our ability to just feel that connection. Within there, if there's anything wise, that's awesome. That's like, by the (laughs) by, I had no idea. (laughs) I think it already is wise. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I'm so drawn to is just the linking between individual and collective. And I think that's where you and I share a lot of similar perspectives and passion. And so we're going to get into that. But let's just start by who are you and what do you do and where do you live and just share a little bit about yourself. So Susan Raffo, I go by either Susan or Raffo. And so if you see things from me out in the world, just see them as both, she, her, hers. I live in Minnesota Makoche, which is in Dakota, the land where the clouds are reflected in the water, also known as Minneapolis, Minnesota. And as you and I are talking, I keep looking outside because I don't know when people will hear this, but right now there's a good 10, 11 inches of snow outside. And it's gorgeous. I love the frozen times. I am so glad I live on land that has such strong, strong seasons. And so that means this is the quiet time. I am a craniosacral therapist, a writer, and an organizer. 
And I have a practice that really weaves, I mean, I say craniosacrotherapy because that's the touch door that I go through first, but NARM in particular, as well as a few other sort of trauma grounded or trauma illuminating practices and frameworks have really added to that work. And then I'm part of two different projects, which we might or might not talk about. One is called the Healing Histories Project, which is looking at we're in the process of creating a timeline that we'll be releasing this April. And the timeline is called How Care Became Control. And it is looking at the series of actions and inactions that over multiple generations have created a care system that unfortunately too often in the most structural way does not deeply honor the dignity and the autonomy of the people who come through its doors, nor the cultural specificity. And then the other project I'm part of is called REP, Relationships Evolving Possibilities. We emerged right after George Floyd was murdered. We're a Black-led project that is looking at what it means to create the conditions for collective safety through relationship. So that's what my work is. Beautiful. Thank you for all the work you're doing locally and also to contribute to healing in our country and our world. And You know, when I was reading your book, you talk about this kind of seminal moment for yourself in 2007 of being at a conference, I think a healing justice conference. And I don't know if you were already a healing practitioner before then, or like, I I guess my question is, I'm curious, like, how did you stumble into healing, into trauma? Was it 2007 or was it before that? I think my favorite phrase is going to be, how did you stumble into trauma? (laughs) Because <laughs> I'm like, well, oh. that's a, a much deeper question. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta go back. <laughs> yeah, a few thousand years. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But in terms of attending to healing work as a practitioner, some degree from when I was a child. When I was a child, I used to see energy as like spangles of light in the sky. I used to call it gold confetti. And that I mostly saw lines of relationship as light, which is one of the things that as a child helped me to sort out who was safe and who was not. And as I got older, that started to go away. But I used to notice like in my teen years and my early 20s, even if I couldn't see it, if I reached out with my hands, I could feel something or I believed I could feel something. And so in my 20s, I started learning a range of, and I'm turning 60 this year, so this is 40 years ago, I started learning a range of practices like shiatsu and massage, but I hadn't yet started to do work on my own healing or my own trauma. And so I had no sense of how do you show up in right relationship to somebody else? What is the boundary between me and them? There's a whole, so I got quite ill and wasn't able to touch folks for a while. And then it was in around 2002, that sense again, there's something here, there's something here to pay attention to. And at that point, I was pretty, most of my work was really strongly doing political work, activist work, organizing work. Mm. And there was outside of culturally grounded spaces, so native community spaces, some black spaces, outside of those spaces, there wasn't really a place to talk about the internal world or even the world of, of spirit and connection. But I kept being pulled to this. And I ended up being exposed to craniosacral therapy through my daughter when she was first born and immediately felt an affinity with it, immediately started taking some courses. This would have been in 2002, 2003. And Brad, it was like coming home. I mean, I was so clear that this was my work. And again, in 2002, 2003, in the Midwest, in the organizing spaces that I was a part of, and there was, this was not the moment where the, the sort of, mainstream conversation about trauma had emerged. I mean, as you know, you were in the work at that time. It was still something that was the conversation was happening within therapeutic spaces and or other regions, but not the Midwest. And I knew, you know, I knew this is what I wanted to do. And I actually was organizing through something called Building a Queer Left, which was a does no longer exists, an organization based in New York. And I had spent a year talking with organizers, with different people doing change work through an LGBTQ lens uh, towards holding a big convening in Atlanta. And the U.S. social forum movement or the world social forum movement, for those who don't know, 
the World Social Forum movement emerged in relationship to the increasing uh, global capitalism, to the World Trade Organization, to the increasing number of economic decisions that were being made outside of any way that just local regular folks who were working had access to those decisions, right? Incre- it was getting further and further away, and who you elect did or did not actually line up with those global conversations. And so the World Social Forum movement is just really a convening of people who are in some relationship to change work, coming together whenever the WTO met, and just exchanging pieces. And out of that, it had never happened in the U.S., and I think it was in India at one of the events, they said, you know, the tagline of the Social Forum movement is, another world is possible. And what they said is, if another world is possible, then another United States is necessary. I know when I say that, there's a motion that comes up in me. And so we were charged with, what does that mean? What is our responsibility to each other locally to build relationship across experiences and across movements? And that's what the U.S. Social Forum movement came out of. And so the piece that you're referring to in the book was the first one in the U.S., in Atlanta. And I went with this growing practice, which was, oh, like explaining and sort of just illuminating so many pieces. Again, the way that in NARM, that question that resonates, that when I first heard you say it, I was like, that is the question. What gets in the way of connection, the way of the thing, as because the thing is already here, the relationship, the wellness is already here. And I was feeling the truth of that without those, that language, but not knowing how to orient to the organizing or the political spaces that had fed me for so long. And um, in Atlanta, through the work of Kindred Southern Healing Justice Collective, which is a, a Black feminist project in the South, they had created something called the Healing Justice Space. And what they were asserting is that is multiple things. One is that movements for change, any kind of change or transformation, includes the ways in which we take care of ourselves. And in particular, for those who are doing change work within systems or moments that are about themselves and their own people, it increases the likelihood that there will be a re-entrenchment of pain in the work of moving towards change. And there are multiple other things, but I'm talking a lot, so I'm going to pause in a second. But that is, um, that's where I was first exposed to the healing justice framework. And for me, Brad, it was also the first time I was exposed to both being in practice and relationship with folks who were working against that Western separation that makes healing about what individuals do and organizing about what we do in groups. Mm. When I say it changed my life, I don't think I can say that with nearly enough italics, bolds, underlines, sparkly emojis around it. (laughs) I'm so glad that you took time to explain that because one of the things I know for myself, my own experience when I was younger and much more politically active, the separation between what people were doing and how they were showing up started to become really problematic for me. And, you know, all these organizations that were so well intended and in some ways were making some very positive impact, but inside the same family dysfunctions that we were trying to address in larger systems was happening in these exact systems that were trying to make the change. And it started to become out of integrity for me in a certain way. Like I, if I, you know, I wanted to see the people that were making the changes be able to walk their talk. And I was having trouble finding spaces that that matched. Uh, So it's nice to hear about your finding these communities and, and being part of building these communities that are doing that. And it makes me very hopeful. And I think, you know, I love that you just said that, Brad, because for me, especially in my early 20s, I was looking for like, where do I find my home? And it's kind of like, what is the thing that we need to start to build towards our own healing? When I went to spaces, and this would have been in the early 80s and mid 1980s, that were doing the opposite, that were really focused on doing the work within, I kept rubbing up against, yes, this is so important, but I feel like you know, what we're not talking about is who's not in the room. Why do they not have access to this room? And as somebody who was raised without, you know, class privilege, who was raised working class, I would be in these spaces and who was also raised in a multiracial community. And I would feel like, oh, possibility. And then I kept bumping up against who wasn't in the room and why they weren't there. And so I feel like this wound that we have inherited where 
this work is just separated. And then we find our home depending on what we need for whatever reason, the sum total of all of our complexities, what is most likely to support our sense of safety within that binary that should not be a binary, is that for me, it was the opposite direction, is finding my way towards feeling like this is enough, which I think is why in the book I talk about the first step of healing has to be ending violence. Because as long as violence, whether it's interpersonal or systemic and structural, is actively taking place, it doesn't always feel like there is enough or there literally is not enough space and support to then slow down enough to pay attention. It's the sadness I feel is the um, sometimes power struggle between those different forms of healing and change when they're actually the same thing. It's just we're drawn to start in different places. Yeah. I'm going to be really excited to hear more about the hatred and violence that you talk about in your book. But if I could, I'd like to return to this image that you brought up about being a child and seeing these, I think you called them the gold speckles. Is that what you call them? As a child, I called it gold confetti. Gold confetti. That's beautiful. <laughs> and then you, you, know, you were reaching out and able to touch into things. And so it's like you already had access to some kind of energetic field, even as a young child. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that and how that kind of moved you forward in terms of your healing. Such a lovely question, Brad. Nobody's ever asked me that. So let me just listen for a second. Yeah, please. So I'm going to answer not in a linear way. I have a lot of curiosity because a few months before I turned seven, I died. I drowned and then came back. And a lot happened in my life at that age. Car accident directly, deeply impacted my whole family. And so the gold confetti, my awareness and memory of what I saw happened after that. So I've always been curious because multiple traditions talk about when you die and come back, you have a different relationship to things outside of organic physical life. For me, I would say to source, to creator. And so I've always been curious about that. And then I assumed that I have no idea <laughs> why, why that was still there. I do know that when I drowned, when I came to in the water, there was a lot that happened in there. But then I heard very clearly this voice that said, you need to swim. And I was like, I don't know how to swim in water over my head. Um, I don't know how to swim. And the voice said, well, it's really easy. Just look up for where that, the water is lighter. That's The light is the outside of the water. So just aim in that direction. You'll get there. And so I did. I looked up and I saw the sort of light and the water interplaying. And, uh, and then I started moving. And I, was, I have a, a slight physical memory of it, Brad of a feeling of like of crawling, of all four limbs being engaged. And what I mostly remember is just this absolute joy. Joy in a way that I have experienced in the world of air you know, sometimes in my life. But joy feels like it doesn't quite get to it. It was like it was that sense of being connected to everything, being completely okay. English is such a, a frustrating language to talk about this sort of stuff. But being completely okay and, oh, like, just being alive, the absolutely permeating all aspects of what it is to be alive, alive. And it felt, I mean, my physical memory of it is that it took a really, really, really long time to get to that boundary between water and air. And then I have no memory of actually crossing, you know, my head coming through the surface I was just suddenly on the side of the river with my head just out of the water, and I was feeling pain. But the reason I went back to tell that story is that feeling of bringing it into my body right now, of being okay in a way that that English concept just doesn't even touch it. Like, all was right, just there. Yeah. I didn't always remember that it was accessible to me because then there was a lot of really difficult things that happened in my life, different forms of violence, different forms of neglect. After that, I didn't always have access to it, but I had access to it sometimes. 
And that for me, healing has been this integration between that aspect that remembers, that has strong relationship with ancestors in my dream, always has that. And then the part that is rational get done is and is in control. And so yeah. that first part of healing ending violence, including the accumulation of experiences that have not yet been able to be attended to. I mean, I would say that was so many years of dealing with abuse and violence in that way. And still that being able to perceive energy was always there, but not all the way available. And once that the gunk of undigested experience began to lighten, feels like remembering, Brad, more than anything else in the most ancient sense of, of the word. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's beautiful. It, it makes me think, I mean, many people that listen to this podcast are familiar with NARM and the NARM principles. And the first pillar of NARM we often talk about as being the intention. Uh, we invite our clients or our patients or those that we're working with to reflect on what it is that they most want for themselves. And it's interesting because, you know, I, I do so much uh, consulting with people that are applying NARM, they struggle with their clients in terms of what's the state that we're looking for, like when we're asking this question to our clients. And sometimes I say this, I think it all the time, which is that it's really just one state. It's really just yeah. the state that you described of being okay. And when a child is born into the world where there's family and community and environmental support and health, that is just the birthright for the child. There's no struggle, there's no efforting that needs to happen to create that internal experience for a child. And yet that's been ripped away from us because of these generations of ongoing trauma and environmental trauma and all the different forms of trauma. So it's beautiful to hear how in your near-death experience, you were able to reconnect to that state of being okay. And that became then the source, it sounds like, partly conscious, partly unconscious, that led you to move into your healing journey as an adult. Thank you for that, Brad. Absolutely. And then aligned with that is what drew me to NARM in the first place, is that there was something about that experience that even as a child, I had this sense that the present moment was impacted by things that happened before we were all born. Mm. So that even when I was being hurt, you know, there was this part of me that was aware, the person who was hurting me, that this was not fully them that was acting. Like, I, you know, as a kid, I would sometimes call it ghosts or beings behind them. I always had this sense as a child of this sense of, well, there's a before. Like, this is not an individual operating in full agency. This is not choice. Without having that kind of cognitive awareness, it was a felt sense that too often I then for erred on the side of forgiving things that were not forgivable because I saw that. My work was to come back to the place of agency in a, a particular way and impact. But with that, Narn, Brad, is, you know, having done a lot of different training through SE, through different elements that are body-based that are also about how trauma is held in the body, I kept feeling, depending on the mood, frustration and or grief or both, about, I was like, where is that before? Like, that's also here in this room. How do we talk about generation? And I remember the first time I encountered Dr. Marie Yellowhorse Braveheart, who is Lakota, who was talking about historical trauma in the 70s and then into the 80s when I first encountered her work. I was like, oh, there. And then Rachel Huda encountering her work. Oh, yes, this is what I'm feeling that I have no language for. And still, in the spaces I was where outside of culture and community, but the spaces of what were mostly white-led spaces, we're still only talking about trauma in an individual sense, very rarely talking about the social context of trauma, so the ways in which activisms work upon our bodies, and very rarely talking about generation. And so when I came across Naram before I met you, it was that. And so I think I listened to everything I could find and that was the first conversations you and I had is the overlapping circle that is developmental and generational trauma. Which is both of our passion. And, you know, it's funny because you and I were writing a book at the same time and I have an advanced copy in front of me. Has it been published yet for the general public? Yes, it came out in November. Oh, OK, great. It's called 
Liberated to the Bone, and it is with AK Press. Yeah, Liberated to the Bone, Histories, Bodies, Futures, beautiful cover. Did you uh, create the cover? I love that you asked that. AK Press has a range of artists, graphic artists and designers, and so I talked through, and I wanted something that was going to be You know, showing that relation, I mean, the fractalness of what's in the body, what's between people, what is in the ecosystem, what is in space to sort of do some getting at those relationships. Yeah, we're not obviously doing video for these podcasts, but I would encourage you to Google the cover. It's a beautiful cover with the roots and then these kind of like energetic cords that go down further than the roots themselves. And it's just a beautiful image. And I think it speaks to the work that you're presenting in here. So let's talk about the book. First of all, I always like to ask, like, where did the book come from? Like, was there inspiration? Was it a moment? Was it building? Just like walk us through what actually led to you sitting down to start creating this. Again, I love this question as well, Brad. This is, and you don't need to know this, but this is actually the third book I have out. There's two books I did in the 90s, which is, you know, pre-internet. They're out of print because they sort of the, again, small publishing houses that get lost in the publishing ships of the 90s early 2000s. But I name that because each of the books I've done have been invited, meaning that they are have that level of relationship. So what became Liberated to the Bone is in the 90s, my primary identity was as a writer. I had books out. I was published in lots of places and then started parenting. I loved my daughter. <laughs> Became a parent in the early 2000s and uh, writing went to the back burner. And then when my daughter was starting to hit her teen years and more space was opening up for my own imagination and creativity in in the way of things, hello parents, I started writing and it was, and I was like, oh my goodness, I'm coming into writing, having missed the whole, like, what does it mean to be a writer when there's an internet? Where do you put things? How do you know where to put things? The entire math of it was different. And I just decided to start writing on a blog and that I would share it with my friends and it would go where it was going to go. And so that's where the book came about, is that the blog, again, in the movement spaces that I'm a part of, the blog became, you know, softly popular, like really tiny P popular in the kind of scale, but enough that pieces would be read by two, three, four thousand folks. And it was out of that that Adrienne Marie Brown, who wrote a book called Emergent Strategy, which when I read Emergent Strategy, I was like, oh, an organizer wrote out what body work means when you're doing it between people and not just cells. It's a great book. And Adrian's a friend also from the social forum experience. And Emergent Strategy became very, very successful in the communities and the worlds that I'm a part of. And so she created an imprint called the Emergent Strategy Series and invited me to take some of the pieces I had been writing through this blog and to bring it into a book. So most of what's in the book is a blog post I wrote with about three new pieces in there. Mm-hmm. So it's putting it in a different format, which was, you know, some of what with this book, Brad, it's like the first two books I did were anthologies that had very clear sort of agendas related to them, goals. This felt different because it was just a, it's what I say in the intro, here's some things that I've learned. You know, it feels very personal. Mm-hmm. It feels like an offering. It doesn't have that same kind of organizing strategy related. It is just an offering. And then we see what happens. Yeah. And you can really feel the aliveness of that. And I'm curious, you talk about this a little bit in the book, the title, Liberated to the Bone. So you and I are both somatic oriented, but not everyone is. Can you walk us through the title itself, Liberated to the Bone? I understood the title after I chose it. (laughs) It it hit me hard. It was looking for a title for a while. And then I knew it was right somatically, but I didn't cognitively understand, therefore, what it meant. And so it was in the months after I chose it that, you know, as people would ask me, that the words started to come. But a few things. Again, you know, the majority of my audience has been people who are in movement, who would say that there's some aspect of their work that is focused on collective care and safety, collective wellness, collective liberation. And so liberated is a word that has meaning and a felt sense in those communities. And so liberated to the bone 
is really a way of, yes, it's the liberation from histories, present moments that get in the way of our ability to feel our own lives, to know that we are safe and connected, but it is taking that within all the way to the bone. It's also, I love our bones, right? Our bones are the part of our body that there are elements of our bones that don't ever decompose, right? So the mineralization that makes up our bones are the same minerals that our great, 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 greats had within their bodies, that the plants and the animals that we've either shared the earth with or whose lives have helped us and our ancestors to actually survive. Those minerals, it's like that mineralization is continually recirculating across life, across generations. So I love the way bones hold time. And then the third part of the bones is that most of the time when we, people who don't get to spend time with living bodies and paying close attention to them, often only encounter bones on the other side of life when they're sort of brittle, dry, immovable things. But the bones, which is, you know, our infrastructure, it's what enables us to move more rapidly. It is what, you know, helps us be something other than a bag of fluids and membranes, is that our bones are very pliable and very moving. So they're this gorgeous infrastructure that is both has a has a habit, you know, it's like for the most part, our skull is where the skull is, although this is not true for all bodies. Not all bones, skeletons are in the same place in all bodies, and there are bodies that are quite fine with bones being different. And still, there's a sort of a collective ancestral wisdom of you know, millions of years that said, yeah, this kind of a structure works really well, and it has to be fluid. It has to be able to repair itself. And that's the last piece about bones that I love, is that the bone's memory is the lining of the bone, the periosteum. And it is a line of fascia, and it's why when you break your bone, assuming that the fascia is sort of repaired and in place, is it will hold the memory. It's like a sleeve that those, the osteocytes and the osteoblasts, that they come together to remake bone. So there's just something about that mix of fluid infrastructure, ancestral connection, the memory of repair, and also the fact that it is a necessary part of us that is largely unseen, unless we have a wound and the bone becomes visible, all of those pieces feel like this poetry around that type. It makes just, even saying it out loud, I'm like, oh, I love our bones. Well, that last part really touched me because that was something that I thought so much about as a kid growing up with a lot of uh, Western medicine around me. Just like the magic of how in many circumstances the bones have the self-healing process. And Western medicine has a hard time explaining that in, in certain ways. And I love that. I love that image. I love the the metaphor around it. Yeah, it's really special. So I, I want to get to, you, you talked about violence before and about how care becomes control. And one of the things I'd like to, before we get there, though, is you said something in the, early in the book that really struck me, which is about this difference. Bet- well, well, I don't know if it's a difference. You'll have to walk us through it. But it sounded like you were differentiating between identity and experience, or, or maybe experience plus connection is what I was kind of holding, but I'm not sure. So can you walk us a little bit through what you meant as it's read to me like you were differentiating between identity and experience? Is that accurate? I don't know which part of the book that you're talking about, but that's something I believe. So I'll just respond from how I believe that. And then you can let me know if that doesn't line up with what you were looking for. Okay. Excellent. And first, I want to be really tender about this because within the power struggle of who gets to explain how we understand life, some of what I'm about to say has been weaponized, has been used as a weapon to dismiss the stories that some of our people are telling about who they are. And so what I'm about to say about identity versus experience in no way wants to contribute, nor would ever deny the truth of the story somebody is saying about themselves and the identities that they name. So I think that identities are deeply important, you know, and for many of us, particularly those of us where there's some aspect of our experience of our lives that are either dismissed, denied, 
outright attacked or ignored is that to come into a sense of being part of a collective identity is deeply liberating. You know, it is the reason why even when you have parents who adore you and are fine, no matter what your gender identity or sexual orientation is, still the act of coming out is about crossing a line. Something is different than what we have understood or believed we were going to be. And then that just gets ramped up even more intensely, depending on the environment that we come out within and the kind of support that's there. Similarly, because, you know, systems of education, policy, et cetera, still are skewed towards centering some lived experiences as being the quote unquote normal. And those most often line up with bodies that have more class privilege, sort of more economic access, are lighter skinned, have certain kinds of education, speak certain kinds of language, English, and ideally are Christian. And so those things just mean those moments where you're like, ah, the shit I've been feeling for so long, I'm not alone. There's like something there. And so that's when identity is asserted. And identity, you know, it is, it's this place that says, I am, and I'm not alone, and it has meaning. And again, that is gorgeous, right? And necessary. And it is a process that probably you and I and everybody who's listening as we're supporting folks in our practices is that we witness people come into that space and the, the healing that is possible as a result of that. What I'm writing about in the book, which I think is what you're getting to, is not ignoring that, but just in the same way for the bones. What happens in that moment of, I am not alone, I am this identity, I am part of this group. If it stops there, to be a part of this group means X, Y, and Z. And it moves, and sometimes, depending on a whole range of factors, that moment of being liberated by identity can actually turn into a box or a cage or a set of rules and regulations that we have to keep bringing ourselves back to. And that box right there to me is all of what NARM is about. Is it's the story, you know, that that even without being directly taught through the front of our brains that we've picked up in so many ways that says, finally, I feel safer. Finally, I feel a sense of belonging. I'm not the strange one in the room. And in this, in order to keep belonging and keep staying safe, I have to keep being this thing. And most of that happens again under cognition. It hits in the place of all of the survival adaptations. I think that sort of there's so many elements of building movements around identity that include some amount of survival adaptation, although not completely. So what starts to has the potential to get lost in that is how there is no single identity that is uniform, that no matter what it is, as somebody who sits here and identifies as woman, I share that identity with so many people, some who have bodies that resemble mine, some who don't. And over time, that identity will shift. And how I experience it most especially, is going to shift through my life. And so I think what you're referring to that I'm talking about is that moment of healing that feels like it's the next moment once there's that, I'm not alone. Like, you know, and I have teachers who, there's a place in Minneapolis called the Cultural Wellness Center, where they're pretty fierce. It's an African-based center. They're pretty fierce about saying in that moment of identity, it's really important that we think about culture not just identity as in an individualized state, but culture, which immediately brings in time and space and the collective. And so for me to look at, to move towards experience, which I'm doing more and more and more, is that most of it is I'm looking for the aliveness in this moment, right? So in no way would I contradict an identity that somebody holds. And I'm really curious about how they're experiencing that identity. What else is a part of that story? And again, not as a way of moving away from identity, but just as a way of expanding that. And the, the last piece I'll say, Brad, is that depending on somebody's survival adaptations, depending on the context within which they and whoever they share that identity with, how much they're being targeted or marginalized, depending on those things, that is going to bring up a, a protective mechanism around that identity, which makes sense and as it should. You know, which is why, again, I would say the first step of healing is ending violence, because to go into the breath and the slowness of what it means to notice the nuance of experience 
is that there does need to be enough space to do that. And so that's why, again, end with tenderness around the reasons why identity can be such a protected state and recognizing that moving outside of that or expanding it is not about what individuals do. It is about how we exist in relationship to each other. And if things are not safe for a particular community to leave their home, then there's other work that we all have to do so that the deep, deep, deep protective awareness of that identity is not the first thing somebody has to live with in order to survive. Well, thank you for sharing that. It's beautiful. And uh, it leads us right into this uh, core piece that you talk about in the book and that I've thought about since I was a child of just the way that humans act in violence and cruelty against each other. And I wonder, again, this the statement you said earlier about how care becomes control. I love that. And I love that you're working collectively on that. And I, I wonder if there's some relationship that you're drawing between that, how care becomes control, and then the violence and the patterns of violence that disrupt people and, and communities. Is there a, a link there for you? Oh, for sure. And it's, I remember, Brad, I think I wrote to you or we talked when I was doing the intro and arm training. I was like, oh my goodness. And I know, you know, when you and I've talked about how, whether or not it, using this word, but I'm like, oh, there's so much about NARM that is about re-indigenizing, which is a term that I hold cautiously, but about coming back to origins, coming back into that full connection with land, with spirit, with culture, with other people and with ourselves. And that's what made me get so buzzy about it. You know, the Healing Histories Project, we're working on a timeline which will be launched in April. And it is, as I said, the timeline of how care became control. And depending on your cultural lineage, the number of generations that you have been on Turtle Island, which is the indigenous name for North America, what kind of shapes of safety and protection your people have had, what your proximity is to a Euro-Christian lineage, whether that is yours or not the lineage of your people. Like all of those things will shift your personal timeline in relationship to this. And, you know, with the timeline, we talk about the medical industrial complex, which is actually a concept that was first named by President Eisenhower as he was talking about the military. And that is a system in which care is based upon profit, is based upon the next best research, is not necessarily centering relationship and the actual pace of healing. And so one of the things the timeline is doing is tracking how that emerged, which includes there's going to be a part of it that is really looking even before people came to the United States, whether you call them settlers or colonizers, but that first wave of non-Indigenous people came and began to seize land and to build a England on this land. Even before that, they brought with them already things that were wounds, already shapes of beingness that had evolved in a different place. And the core shape of beingness that we're working with is the capacity to perceive of life as an object, period. Your life as an object, the life of other beings as an object, both other humans, animals, the earth itself as an object to which value can be assigned, then once that value is assigned, a binary of worth it or not worth it, good or bad, dangerous or innocent, then gets assigned, and then out of that systems are built. So that's the lineage, right? And it's again, as I said to you with Naram, when you ask the question, you know, we are all connected, which we are, all life is always connected. But what gets in the way of feeling that connection? The minute I heard that NARM question, I was like, oh, you got my heart. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. And then that gets to sort of, to violence, to harm, to neglect, both individually and systemically and collectively, is that the minute my people are, my lineages are, three of my grandparents are straight up, you know, European Catholic. And one of my lineages, my mother's uh, paternal line is we are both indigenous to Turtle Island and European Catholic. We've not lived tribally for at least four generations, so I don't identify as native, but my people, there's a part of my lines that are native to here, is the minute that we were able to turn life into an object, right? Which And there's specifics here that are about dualism and how dualism grew within Christianity, doesn't exist in the same way in Judaism or in Islam, 
There's a lot of pieces that are there that sort of set the conditions for the possibility for me to see another life as an object, to understand that object is dangerous, and to then feel justified in doing things to protect myself from that danger. And so out of that makes the possibility of violence and harm to not actually feel like it, which is how, and I'm going to slow down as I say this, which is how it was and it is possible for people who identify strongly as Christian to go to church in the morning and a lynching in the afternoon, to go to church in the morning and then go to work and take children away from their parents and to assume that that is justified, and to take them outside of community, is that that is a life contradiction that has been so normalized in many of our bodies and our systems that we don't even notice. And so I say there's ancestral trauma, there's generational trauma, but there's also generational supremacy or generational dismissal or certainly generational freeze, which started as trauma, but then became a survival adaptation that was built into the systems around us to such an extent that we have to work through a bunch of stuff to even get to the fact that beneath it all is trauma. Yeah, even that way of framing it is helping to humanize it because I think you're spot on. I I mean, we can't really hurt other people if we have a heart connection to them. We have to dehumanize, we have to objectify people or beings or the planet in order to do the things that we do that really harms and creates violence. And, you know, I know you talk in your work, we talk a lot in our work about shame and empathy and reflecting on impact. You have a whole section about reflecting on impact and relational impact. And yeah, there's so much alignment. So it makes sense that we we enjoy these conversations because I think at the root of our both healing approach, but also just our worldview is very aligned. And I think People know this in a deep way, and it's very scary. It's scary for how to return to it. It's scary for how to live it. My mentor has this saying, in a world of bent over people, the one standing upright looks strange. (laughs) And so, you know, who's going to be that person that's going to live this different kind of life? I've been working on curriculum right now for the NARM training around what we call intersubjectivity something we've we've borrowed from earlier psychodynamic models. And this idea that really like when you're a helping professional working with a individual, it's really just this process of two human beings accessing greater humanity inside themselves. And all of the skills and all those things are so secondary to our capacity to really be in our humanity, be in our heart and show up in a present open way with another person. Yes. And I think that that's what we're trying to return to both individually, relationally, collectively. So, I mean, this leads us to the last part here. And I know you talk about this in the book, but maybe we can give our listeners just a little bit of idea of like, what are some of the ideas for change and for growth and healing that you present in the book or that you hold in your own life? I'm really aware, Brad, that I'm happy to respond to that. And I know that the shape of this podcast is that you're interviewing me. And I'm really, I reached it a little bit ago, but it just came up strong in our conversation. Is like, oh, this is where we get some tea. And then I'm like, so Brad, tell me. <laughs> no, I feel the, the sort of that back and forth energy that's happening. So I'm going to keep feeling it, even though I know my voice is taking up an awful lot more space. But hi, real person. <laughs> I really care about you. Yeah, and people get to hear my voice a lot. So it's, I yeah, I, I, I love having people like you on because I learned so much. It's such a great opportunity to connect. And like I said at the beginning, we've wanted to do this for a long time. And I'm hoping this will be just the first of ongoing conversations and collaborations for us. But yes, you know, I'm going to answer the question, but I know that um. I'm going to keep scope and norm and look at the ways that I can get in closer, you know, as somebody who's not a licensed therapist, because I do think that oppression, harm, whatever you want to call them, they're all just different forms of relationship betrayal. Yeah. And everything that norm is about is supporting the conditions for relationship and connection to come. And so it feels good to link arms and to notice the different fronts that we're working in. And I'm excited for the places where that might overlap more. Some places that I continue to have a curiosity about, which I've shared with you, which are the places I think that collectively we're still awkward 
around moving between here's how we work to shift and change systems, here's how we work to do stuff with inside, is that we still have a lot of awkwardness about how those come together and a lot of mistrust and confusion that is part of different shapes of relationship betrayal that I think are also just in the mix. I actually feel really emotional as I'm saying it about this wave of softening. Excited about and feel hopeful. You know, at this point, I'm like, (laughs) I don't really know what's going to get us to the other side of where we want to go. I do believe that doing the work of softening relationship and connection is a huge part of it. Is that enough? Our descendants will know for us. So it's just something meta responses. I have no idea, Brad. Yeah. And then within it, the practices that I'm in, because I have some faith in them, really, you know, Healing Histories Project with the Timeline, I do believe that the lifting up of stories that have otherwise not fit whatever the prevailing narrative is about who we are is an essential part of how we orient towards each other. And that I believe within that, we build our capacity for those stories to contradict each other. You know, this is not trading one right answer for another right answer, but we have a ways to go collectively where I think there are many experiences and stories that are largely not heard within what we assume it is to live on this land together. So that's the Healing Histories Project timeline. I do believe looking at stories and listening for stories so that other patterns, collective patterns can emerge so that when we say who we are, there's even more complexity and nuance on that. That's one. But the work I really want to focus on is what we're doing with REP, because I think it has the two parts that are there. As I said, REP came into being in the month after George Floyd was murdered, and it was started by Jason Soule and Signe Harity, two uh, Black organizers here in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And they pulled together an additional three people. I was one of them who we had all already had deep trust, Brad, like we had been in some way working together, caring about each other for over 20 years. And so there was already some amount of trust. And we wanted to build something that has two fronts. One is to support practice, concrete skills building, and relationship deepening for people in their neighborhoods, within whatever their chosen family is, or their family, whoever the people are, So that in in moments of crisis, urgency, and vulnerability, we have people to call and skill sets. That means we don't have to call a state system that might or might not respect who we are, right? And so it's really intending to get at those 80% of 911 calls that really don't need somebody to come in who can use force or a certain kind of power to interrupt a pattern that's taking place. So that's everything from welfare calls, minor tension and struggle, not high conflict, certainly not where there's active violence, but things where de-escalation is possible or distraction possible with some amount of skills and the ability to sort of ground and orient yourself in that moment where de-escalation is possible. And then there's so many other reasons why 911 gets called, which has nothing to do about any of that. You know, think about the cat in the tree sort of stories. Yeah. And so we wanted to build that really as a way, and this is what it aligns with NARM work, as supporting individual collective agency. How do we remember in moments of crisis, vulnerability, and struggle that we are not alone and that together there's a lot more that we can hold and that at the end of the day, how we show up for each other in these moments is what builds the world that we want to live in as much as figuring out what the right systems are to have in place. So that's the first half. We do things that we call studios, where we just spend a lot of time teaching trauma triggering, which we call time traveling, how to uh, self-regulation and collective regulation, de-escalation, mental health crisis first aid, basic legal rights, a range of things. And then we do scenario practice again and again and again, like any other practice. So, you know, if we were to do it right here, I'd be like, you're in your house. Here's what happens. What do you do in that moment? It's the same thing we do with clients, right? It's that readiness practice to respond to situations that are outside of the norm. So that's the first front. And the second front is that we then have a team of people that we train to be on the end of a call so that if somebody is like, I don't have somebody to call in this moment, I don't want to call somebody I don't know for many of our beloveds in particular, Black beloveds, Indigenous beloveds, trans beloveds, et cetera, sometimes calling 911 does not feel safe. If I even more directly, calling 911 does not feel safe. Yeah. 
And so we are not, we're very clear that we are not a replacement for 911. That's not what we are. If you call our line, our role is to love you to your next step. And so what we are believing is that if you're calling, we are going to hold you with dignity and care and respect, period. We are not here to solve whatever's going on. We're certainly aware that if somebody is calling, it's likely that there's a complexity of reasons that are there. We're not going to diagnose, fix, solve. We are going to do exactly what happens in an arm session. In this moment, what is getting in the way of your ability to know what your next step is? That's it. And our belief, again, it's linking ours with NARM, is that if we companion someone in that way, and we practice companioning, is that a lot of the time, not all the time, but a lot of the time, something will soften and something else, a different possibility, a different state of being, an insight will emerge, which then makes other things possible. And so that's what our role is, you know, which Interestingly enough, for people who are carers, that's the hardest thing. I mean, it's the reason I think in the NARM training where, you know, not trained as a therapist in the um, the number of times I was like, oh, you are speaking directly to how some forms of therapy trains therapists to sort of have the right answer and watching this sort of unlearning that was there throughout NARM is that that unlearning is true whether you've gone through therapy or not, right? It is that Western individualism shaping. And it, it's care. It's, you know, again, it's where care became control. I show that I care for you by helping so your burdens are lighter. I show I care for you by figuring something out so you don't have to. That's the interpersonal. You take that to the level of system and it becomes more and more intense. And so that's what rep is. So, you know, when I boil that down to what that means for somebody who doesn't have rep where they live is in terms of the collective sense, you know, certainly learning who are the people who are in your community, what are the contexts and conditions impacting their lives that you share or that are different from yours. What is it to build relationship, not towards agreeing with who should be elected in office and what the world should look like, but you build relationship with those you're in proximity with to be able to call each other if something is going on, right? If something is difficult. So it is that building of relationship. And then it is that practice of doing the work internally and then in the systems that we're a part of to notice. And this feels so norm to notice when we, you know, what is the power in this moment? What is our sense of control in this moment? How are we loving or being loved to our next step? What does that look like for where we are? Which is so not very concrete. To be more concrete than that, we need the specifics of, of a real person. But that is... It's like creating the conditions for sort of a collective sense of ourselves in addition to a deeper individual sense. Wow. Well, this has been such a rich conversation. I I wonder for folks that want to learn more about you and your work and find out about some of these uh, projects, where can they go? Well, if you want to find me, I've got a website, www.susanraffo.com. I do still blog. Stuff still goes up there. It's been quiet since the book just came out, but that is still my address. And I I like just putting words out there just because I put them out there. So that's always going to happen. If you're curious about rep, what I was just naming, the address for that is www.rep, that's R-E-P-M-N, M-N M-N for Minnesota, www.repmn.org. And then for the Healing Histories Project, at this point, there's not a lot there. But if you're compelled and curious about the timeline, which will be launched in April, which certainly includes within it 500 plus years of U.S. organizing and shaping in relationship to all kinds of stuff within the field that we call mental health. That would be www.healinghistoriesproject.com. And you can go into there, sign up. We don't send out very much emails or anything like that, but that way you'd get notification when that site is up, if it's something you're curious about. Wow. Well, thank you so much again for all that you're bringing into the world and into this larger community of folks that are dedicated to healing justice. And I look forward to our next conversation already. Me as well. And this is the place where I want to ask you so many questions about NARM. (laughs) So I will, and about where NARM is in addition. So I'll wait for that next. But Brad, thank you for your work. And thank you in your own work for, again, you and I really gravitate towards each other around the collective individual and historical and how they fit together. 
And yeah. I really appreciated a number of the podcast episodes where you have been lovingly interrogating what it means to be Jewish within the context of those three, and also lovingly interrogating many other aspects of self within that. And I don't know if it has felt like a risk for you to do that or anything like that. I know that I have deeply benefited by the way that oh, you are asking you. questions. And so I just feel I continue to be grateful. Thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And this is the journey. So here we are. All right, Susan, take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brad. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more about our guest and their work, check the show notes or visit us at narmtraining.com slash transforming trauma. Are you interested in deepening your understanding of NARM? We're excited to present the Inner Circle, NARM's online learning community. Each month, members receive direct mentorship from NARM creator, Dr. Lawrence Heller, and NARM training director, Brad Kammer, access to NARM demonstrations with extensive debriefs, and the opportunity to engage with the hub for the international NARM community. Dive in with a free 14-day trial and access the three-month archive by visiting www.narmtraining.com forward slash free trial. Thanks to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Tori Essex for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community, connection with you, and changing the world by transforming trauma. <laughs>